This is the Schnauzer Logic Radio Company. The Big Idea Podcast presents The Billionaire's Guide to Effective Storytelling and Other Good Advice. A Brief Primer. Part 1 of 3. In this episode, you'll hear a brief introduction, the preface, a discussion of why we tell stories, a review of the classic tools of persuasion, ethos, logos, and pathos, and a description of my very own patent-pending method for next-level business storytelling known as the trick. The entire guide is available as a PDF, ebook, and audiobook at linktree slash tbg2est. That's linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash T-B-G two E-S-T. And you can reach me directly on LinkedIn, Robin Diane Goldstein, or by email, robingoldstein at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. The Billionaire's Guide to Effective Storytelling and Other Good Advice. A Brief Primer by Robin Diane Goldstein. Read by the author. Epigraph. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story unless you can't think of anything better. Mark Twain. Maybe. A brief introduction. A search for the phrase storytelling plus business plus book on Amazon returns over 10,000 results with the surprising revelation that customers who purchased a top-rated volume also purchased a deluxe meat and cheese lover's gift tray from Hickory Farms. Story and storytelling are currently hot topics for business writers and consultants, and everyone has a take on why it's important and how you should do it. And given that we spend most of our lives immersed in story, you'd think there wouldn't be much room or need for instruction. But what you've been told you should do, or may want to do, and what you feel you're capable of doing are often separated by a wide chasm filled with rules and directives and warnings, and any attempt to make a connection with another human being can be fraught, given the possibility of failure. So perhaps it's not surprising that there's an awful lot of advice out there. Which begs the question, why did I decide to pull myself away from a marathon rewatch of the entire 1980s TV sitcom Who's the Boss? Eight seasons. 196 episodes, to put pen to paper and finger to keyboard to prepare this 10,001st guide. Because years ago, I read a book on the different practices of shamanism found among indigenous peoples, and one model that stood out described a world in which the shaman is given access to knowledge or information not generally available to other members of the community. And it's the shaman's responsibility to share that knowledge, knowing that if they keep it for themselves, it will cause them to go insane. And since my current insurance provides very little reimbursement for mental health services, I decided that reliving the adventures of Tony and Angela and Mona and the rest of the McKelly Bauer clan could wait until after I disclosed everything I knew about how to tell uniquely effective stories of transformative technologies and products and platforms. Standard Silicon Valley stuff. I don't know anything about stories in the Spider-Verse. In this short volume, I draw upon all that I learned while staying in bed for a semester in college and reading everything written by Vonnegut and Ellison and Heinlein. Well, one thing I learned is that's not a good way to pass a thermodynamics final. And writing patent applications and stand-up comedy routines and having a talk radio show and working for over 30 years for consumer product giants like Sony and Apple, as well as a number of tech startups in a wide range of roles. In short, information not generally available to other members of the community. If you find this guide helpful, I'm delighted. If not, please disregard it and move on quickly to one of the other 10,000 options. I promise I won't be offended. But be sure to get one of those gift trays. It was delicious. Preface. In 2015, I was already a 20-year Apple veteran when I was unexpectedly called into an executive's office to help him prepare for a presentation to the board of directors. He was going to disclose plans for a new, highly secretive project that a few of us had been working on, and he wanted some talking points. I showed up with a colleague who was equally unprepared for this spontaneous meeting, and we knocked and entered and stood before the seated exec who said, Well, what do you got? My partner, wasting no time, just started talking. Imagine Yosemite Sam forcing Bugs Bunny to dance by shooting at his feet. The exec listened to this impromptu word salad and then turned to me and said, How about you? What do you have? I paused for a moment and replied, 
Before I answer, I'd like to know what you want to accomplish in your meeting with the board. The exec sparked a bit of anger and said, Well, I'm not looking for anyone's approval. And I said, No, no, of course not. But sometimes it's helpful for us to talk about our plans in a way that makes it easier for those we're talking to to support us, especially when we're no longer in the room. It was an interesting experience. I'd been trained as a lawyer, and one of the things I learned from successful litigators is that you want to tell a story that gets the jury's head nodding when you start talking and keeps them nodding until you finish, so that when you get to the end, they have no choice but to think, well, I agree with everything she said, so I guess I'm in total agreement with her conclusion. In law school, they talk about a similar concept known as giving the judge a hook to hang his hat on, or providing reasons for someone to justify doing the thing that you want them to do. And if that had been the full extent of my work with this exec, I might not be writing this at all. But a few weeks later, I was driving to an appointment when I got a call from this fellow's admin who said, are you coming to the strategy meeting that's already started and wasn't on your calendar? I guess I am now, I replied, and made a U-turn and hightailed it into the main building and up to the exec's office. Once there, I could see that the exec and another colleague had filled a whiteboard with an illustration of the current broken model of the system we were trying to change. I'd seen this figure before, a kind of Krebs cycle of frustration. The exec loved drawing it and circling the interior section over and over to emphasize the futility of the existing process. I stood by silently, and after a few minutes, the exec turned and looked at me and pointed to the drawing and said, you don't like this, do you? It's not that I don't like it, I replied, but I don't think it says what you think it says to someone who's not already thinking about it in the same way you are. And as my colleague found a way to become invisible, the exec said in slow, measured tones, Okay, then, what would you say? And I began to wax poetic on the meaning of life, the universe, and everything, and expound on my grand unified theory of disruptive innovation. And as I spoke, I could feel myself leave my body and float over the three of us in the room. And looking down, I could see the confused and horrified faces of my compatriots. And a little voice in my head said, I don't know what you think you're doing, but you need to land this thing. And so I re-entered my body and gathered my senses and said rather abruptly and right in the middle of a thought. And with that, I think I'll stop talking. And I did. And the room filled with the silence of a billion iPhone users waiting for their latest iOS update to finish. After a long moment, The exec shouted at me, Well, sure, everybody knows that. That's not helpful. And besides, what I don't need is another goddamn Steve rant. In hindsight, there are many takeaways from that exasperated utterance. But in the moment, the only thing I could think of was, he just compared me to Steve. The exec then gathered some things from his desk and said, I'm going down to lunch. I'll be back in half an hour. If you really have a better idea, you can show it to me when I return. He walked out of the room. I turned to my once again visible coworker and said, what do you think we should do? I don't know, he said, but I'm sure there's somewhere else I need to be. And he left. So I sat down at a small table in the corner of the office and thought, I have less than 30 minutes. I can't prepare a complete deck, but I think I can prepare a single slide. What am I going to say? And what popped into my head was, once upon a time, and three boxes. Box one, once upon a time, the world looked like X. Box two, we believe the future, that is, our version of the world where we get to live happily ever after, should look like Y. And box three, today we start the journey from where we are to where we want to be by taking our first step, our inaugural product and service, and that looks like Z. And since I'm not a screenwriter, I didn't recognize that what I had stumbled onto or innately recognized from a lifetime of telling and being told stories was the classic structure of setup, conflict, and resolution. Or in my case, a slightly convoluted setup, resolution, and conflict. But I completed that single slide in my three boxes and printed out a copy just as the exec was returning. And as he sat down, I walked over and handed him my slide and said, here's what I got. He stared at that sheet for a long moment, then looked up and gave me a big, warm smile and said, I like it. And then he reached into his drawer and pulled out a piece of paper that had that same circle of doom illustration he had drawn on the whiteboard and said, but I want you to prepare a slide that shows this instead. 
And I did, as perfectly as one could hope, with graphics and animation. And we displayed that slide during a dry run for the board, and he looked at it, and he said, nope, and we never showed that illustration again. At that moment, I decided my mission would be to help folks with great ideas learn how to tell their stories in a way that resonated with customers and investors and anyone else whose head they wanted to ensure was nodding up and down at the beginning, middle, and end of their story. The discussion of why we tell stories is often dismissed with a everybody knows that wave of the hand, but I think there's value in taking inventory of all the ways stories can be used. We'll do that. The discussion of how we tell stories is frequently presented as an unnecessarily complex set of steps and rules, but I think we can take what we already understand after an exposure to a lifetime of stories and leverage that knowledge to create engaging and effective narratives. We'll do that too. My goal is to help innovators tell their stories in a way that propels their company or product or service forward in a compelling manner. This work is one step toward allowing me to fulfill that version of my own happily ever after. Robin Diane Goldstein, August 21st, 2023, Los Gatos, California. Why? I like the question why. It contains the potential to understand all human behavior. It's simple and direct and deceptively powerful. And as anyone who's ever spent time with a toddler knows, it's infinitely recursive. The answer to every why can logically be followed with another why. Over and over, ad infinitum, turtles all the way down. But I hadn't given much thought to the why of story until I spent an afternoon with my friend Chrissy Farr. Chrissy is a journalist and an author and has been working on a book entitled Gripped, exploring how storytelling can be used to fuel success in the business world or mask epic failures. And as I sit here narrating this, her book has not yet been published. But whenever you hear this, be sure to check and see if it has. And if so, get it. I highly recommend Chrissy's work. She's a wonderful writer, insanely intelligent and hyper-inquisitive. And while I suspect that there may be some broad overlap in our analysis of the power of story, neither of us is the first to tackle the topic. That honor goes to Aristotle and his book, Poetics. Anyway, Chrissy reached out to tell me she was writing her book and asked if I'd be up for a walk and talk around San Francisco to share my thoughts on one of the business world's greatest storytellers, Steve Jobs. As we talked, I reflected on recent experiences with some of my consulting clients, super bright folks who had developed compelling technologies and solutions, but were having a challenging time securing financial or commercial interest. And in each case, when we talked through their product or service, they had no problem describing the what or the how of their offering, but stumbled over the why, the so what, the who cares. I'd spent years working inside large corporations and as a private consultant, advising folks on how to talk about what they were offering in a way that would cause their customers to say, I didn't know I needed this and now I can't live without it. But that advice often came across as abstract or at best, a nice to have. As we walked, I said, you know, I think there are a lot of reasons to tell stories, and it may be worthwhile to try to understand the motivation of those you'll be profiling to examine what they were hoping to achieve, so you'll have some context when evaluating whether they were successful. When she asked what I meant, I said, well, we tell stories too, and then began to rattle off a list. And she pulled out a little notepad and began writing down what I was saying, and I realized I might have accidentally stumbled onto something important but I had never fully explored the why of telling stories when talking with colleagues and clients, always assuming the reasons were obvious. So I sat down and tried to remember what I said that caused Chrissy to pull out her pad and pen, and what I came up with are the following, quote, reasons people tell stories. And to be clear, this list is non-exhaustive, non-canonical, and not presented in any particular order. But in my mind, we tell stories to entertain, to persuade, to caution, to educate, to influence, to show empathy, to create connection, to comfort, to heal, to admonish, to distract, to illustrate understanding, to provide inspiration, to share traditions and values, and to reconnect with our shared humanity. Now, I recognize that some of these may be duplicative and some may be subsets of others. And I realize that you might come up with a completely different list, which is terrific. 
The point of this exercise is not to be prescriptive, but rather to remind the listener that there's a wide range of reasons we tell stories, and getting permission to do something, which I now see is not even on the list, is only one. And if you dismiss the need to develop a story to go along with your venture, reasoning, well, sure, everybody knows that, you'll not only be leaving some powerful tools untouched, but you'll also be creating a vacuum that will allow others, possibly far less sympathetic to your mission, to control the narrative and to tell your story. Plus, in my humble opinion, the world could use a few more Steve rants. Ethos, Pathos, and Logos Earlier, I mentioned Aristotle's Poetics as one of the first works on the concept and structure of story. And if you thought, boy, I hope we get to talk more about Aristotle, then you're in luck. But if you thought, man, I hope that's the last we hear of Aristotle, then although you're in good company when it comes to a discussion of modern philosophy, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed with this section. But fear not. If you listen all the way to the end, I promise to tell you a joke. And anyway, there's a lot here that you can put to use right away. Now, when we talk about story in the service of business or product, as opposed to pure entertainment, we're generally also talking about persuasion, mostly in the form of trying to convince someone to act in a particular way, like getting them to do something or buy something or invest in something. And when we're talking about persuasion, if it isn't of the Don Corleone type, we're going to make him an offer he can't refuse variety, we're also talking about using the tools of rhetoric. Now, according to ChatGPT, Rhetoric refers to the art and skill of using language effectively and persuasively to communicate, influence, and persuade an audience. It involves the use of various techniques and strategies to convey ideas, emotions, and arguments in a compelling manner. Rhetoric has been studied and practiced for centuries and is commonly associated with persuasive speech, writing, and communication. And while the Oxford Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, second edition, agrees with this definition, it adds the following parenthetical, which we'll note and come back to. Rhetoric is now often regarded as lacking in sincerity or meaningful content. Aristotle, in his not very creatively titled treatise Aristotle's Rhetoric, describes what he believes are the three pillars of persuasion, ethos, pathos, and logos. And while you may not have heard these terms before, you'll undoubtedly recognize what each means, either because you've used them or because others have used them on you. Ethos is an argument that is grounded in the writer's or speaker's expertise, status, or authority. Four out of five dentists recommend sugarless gum to patients who still have teeth is an ethos argument. Ethos says you should trust dentists' recommendation on sugarless gum because these folks are authorities. They went to school and have advanced degrees and specialized education and experience and credentials and speak with authority when it comes to tooth and gum. Pathos is an argument that makes an emotional appeal. And by emotional, I don't necessarily mean sad. It can be any emotion. Appeals to fear, desire, Anger, happiness, loneliness, anticipation, amusement, nostalgia, jealousy, and frustration are all emotional appeals. The great epidemic of our time, FOMO, is grounded in a strong appeal to pathos, as is every Hallmark Channel Christmas movie and any commercial where a female singer-songwriter asks for just a small donation to save the life of an adorable puppy. As you might imagine, pathos can be very powerful. Tugging at your heartstrings is a well-known saying. Tugging at your fascination with someone's advanced degree isn't. But despite its power, in many fields, pathos arguments are dismissed as being too emotional. And that's often code for, that's an argument based on weakness, or that's not a serious argument. And although I obviously disagree, when you incorporate elements of pathos into your story, you may well get pushback from co-founders or advisors or others who say that they know better. And I want you to be prepared. Forewarned is forearmed. Unless, of course, you're getting pushback from the world forearm record holder, Jeff Dobb, whose forearms clock in at over 20 inches. That's an argument you're going to lose. Finally, we have logos, which is an argument that appeals to logic or reason. Our device does the work of three of our competitors' devices and is smaller, faster, and cheaper. That's an appeal to logos, something with more functionality that takes up less space, works better, and costs less, is logically more desirable than the three devices it replaces. You can think of a logos argument in its simplest form as the, 
obviously it's better argument, or Aristotle's take on duh. Now, the first time someone introduced the concepts of ethos, pathos, and logos to me, I had a bit of trouble distinguishing between ethos and logos. Pathos is easy. Its eyes are always red from crying. Apparently, I wasn't alone, because as soon as I started asking questions, I was presented with this illustration, which was intended to make everything clear. And in the uh, written book, there is an image. It says, your argument as the Starship Enterprise. And then on the left, you see Logos Spock, arrangement, evidence, and logic. Then in the center, you see Pathos Kirk, emotional effects of the speaker's words. And on the right, you see Ethos Bones, speaker's credibility and ethical speaking. And this image was a bit helpful, but perhaps too cute by half, as my dad would say. Fortunately, others, many others, have recognized the value of applying more relatable illustrations to the obscure subject of Aristotle's treatise, and if you use your favorite search engine to look for images with the term ethos, pathos, and logos, you're sure to find a lot of examples, one or two of which may be more relevant and illustrative to you. This is my favorite so far, but that might change by the time I finish writing. Now there is a uh, cartoon strip here, and it's entitled Why I Didn't Do My Homework by Mr. Beale. And then the first strip says ethos. And there's a teacher looking at a student and says, why didn't you do your homework? And the student says, the Department of Education says that it's bad for my mental health. And then the second one says pathos. And the teacher says, why didn't you do your homework? And the student says, my goldfish died last Tuesday, and I am still in mourning. And then the third one says logos. And the teacher says, why didn't you do your homework? And the student says, the more time I spend doing homework, the less time I spend watching birds, so I don't have to do it. Nothing better than describing illustrations in an audiobook. Anyhow, if you think about it, despite the use of these three Greek words, the ideas of ethos, pathos, and logos aren't foreign, and they may even seem obvious. You should believe me because I'm an expert in the field. You've either heard that or said that or both. You should believe me because there's no other logical choice. It's just common sense. Again, likely both heard and said. And, please don't give me a ticket, officer, sir. I was only speeding so I could spend some time with my sick mother who's taking care of her sick cat who's just had six kittens. The cat, not my mother. Even if not heard or said, you can certainly imagine your own emotional appeal to an authority figure to arrive at a pathos argument. The point is, these aren't obscure concepts. These are techniques we each use in some combination in our daily lives. The real question is, when it comes to trying to be persuasive in the commercial sphere, to tell compelling stories to potential investors and customers, especially in connection with the development of advanced technologies, why do most business leaders use only one, or at most two, of these three tools of persuasion? As I thought about this section, I originally planned to make that last sentence a rhetorical question, no pun intended. But because my goal is to ensure that every reader becomes a better storyteller, I'll share what I believe to be the answer with the same proviso I always give students, I'm not right, I'm just loud. And here's what I think. First, a lot of entrepreneurs are blinded by their own genius, high on their own supply, if you will. They've come up with something so amazing, so dazzling, so revolutionary, that its value should be obvious QED. Clearly, there are many problems when this is your approach, arrogance just being the tip of the iceberg. Second, if you've been working on something complicated or hard for a long time, it's natural to want to show off and let others, especially your peers, know just how clever you are and what you've been able to accomplish. So it's not surprising there's a tendency to dive deep into the details, often beyond the point of utility, getting lost in the weeds and focusing on the what and how in service of the greatest nerd question of all time, wouldn't it be cool, without addressing the third leg of why, aka, so what, who cares, which are points best addressed by leveraging an argument based in pathos, because it makes your argument personal and connects your story to an individual rather than a broad, amorphous group. Back when I was a late-in-life budding talk radio host, an instructor at broadcasting school warned us about the beginner's tendency to get behind a microphone and try to shout at the entire world. Greetings, everybody, she noted, is just about the most impersonal thing you can say. Rather, you should try to imagine yourself talking to a single listener, having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. 
And while this is good advice, it can be hard to implement given the abstract nature of trying to have a discussion with someone who isn't actually there. The plot of some very successful movies. The fact that it's hard and can feel awkward also means that it often doesn't get done at all. Plus, there's still the old-school point of view that emotions and business don't mix. And you don't have to think too hard to come up with examples of where this isn't true, but appealing to the familiar or personal still makes many leaders uncomfortable. But A, it shouldn't, and B, it doesn't have to, and C, in the next section, we'll provide some tips on how you can add an element of pathos to your story without the need to find a therapist and work through your childhood trauma stemming from always getting the smallest piece of pie. Promise. And before we leave this section, a few final thoughts and the joke. Contrary to my point above, there's often a strong focus on pathos when innovating in the health and medical field. A lot of founders tell a personal story of illness, their own or a close family member or friend, as the impetus for their efforts. And that's great as far as it goes, but because medical challenges are truly unique and specific to the individual, if that's the only rhetorical tool used, a story can quickly lose impact when it becomes clear that the company may well feel its founder's pain, but hasn't shown that it understands the unique needs of each customer. Fortunately, this can be addressed in the crafting of your story as long as it's recognized and understood. Second, you may recall from a few paragraphs earlier that the Oxford Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, second edition, added a parenthetical to the definition of rhetoric, to wit, rhetoric is now often regarded as lacking in sincerity or meaningful content. That's because in many parts of our lives, we've become so inundated with false emotion and fraudulent self-serving appeals that we're jaded when it comes to the slick messaging clearly intended to separate us from our hard-earned money. But that doesn't mean that we should shy away from using all the tools of rhetoric. Instead, we must recognize that, bad poetry filter on, in such a field of snow so cold, that's not pristine as was foretold, but stomped on, icy, gray, and old, a chance for courage can unfold. And duty falls on us bestowed to tread where others might forebode. Experience and insight sowed will conquer that less traveled road. Bad poetry filter off. Don't at me. And finally, as promised, a joke. A duck walks into a bar and says to the bartender, Hey, bartender, give me a beer, please. The bartender looks at the duck and says, Wait a minute, you're a duck. You don't have any money. If I give you a beer, how are you going to pay for it? And the duck says, oh, that's not a problem. Just put it on my bill. Note to the editor, please make sure we substitute a real joke before publication. The Trick In the preceding section, I went over the three cornerstones of rhetoric, ethos, pathos, and logos, and theoretically that covers all the tools you'll ever need to craft a compelling story. But in my travels, I discovered that it was often challenging for the folks I worked with to imagine what might motivate others or to put themselves into someone else's shoes, especially at some point in the future. So I developed a technique called the trick to help unlock this kind of insight, and I began using it while interviewing candidates at Apple for a spot on the new super-secret, not-yet-announced Apple Health team to see who might be focused only on cool engineering challenges and who could see beyond the technology to the experiences we hope to enable. I named this process the trick as a callback to the comedy magic of Penn and Teller, who would tell the audience how a trick was done before they did it, but even after the audience saw it performed, they would still be amazed. My trick isn't six nights a week at the Rio Hotel and Casino, astounding, but if you can master it, and you can, you'll be able to escape the shackles of poor storytelling better than Houdini. See how I managed to free myself from that tortured metaphor? Instructions for the budding magician Think about the product or project you're working on, the thing you're excited about sharing with the world, the thing that gets you out of bed every morning. Think about all you know about it, all the details, all the effort and money and time and technology that's gone into creating it. Think about what you've given up to get where you are. Be nostalgic and honest and completely immersed in your journey. Now pause, take a breath, and close your eyes. Yes, really close your eyes. And imagine a point in the future. It doesn't have to be 20 years from now, but 
not tomorrow or next week or even next year. I'm talking about a point beyond budgets and schedules and tactical thinking and planning. And with your eyes still closed, see people using your product, benefiting from your service. People you don't know or haven't met. People who aren't family or investors. See these strangers who are embracing what you've done, what you've created, what you've made possible. What specifically are they doing? How are they living their lives? What have you enabled or unlocked for them? Have you made it possible for them to do something they thought impossible? Or made it easier or less expensive? Created new choices? Removed barriers? Improved their physical or emotional health? Given them hope or joy or time? Help them to make new connections, develop new skills or interests, revive old dreams. I want you to fully visualize this literal new world that you've helped bring to life. Make it three-dimensional. Hear the sounds and smell the smells and feel the energy of human beings living with the benefit of what you've made possible. Spend some time here. Take it all in. Commit it to memory. Then pause. Take a breath. Smile. And open your eyes. Yes, the ones I told you to really close. If you've done this, or simply attempted to do it, even if you feel you haven't been fully successful, you've begun to unlock the secret to telling an especially powerful, impactful, and relatable version of your story. A story that excites you, further transformed into a story that allows others to see themselves in the world of your imagination and then to begin to tell their own story, picking up where yours leaves off. This is the trick. And as you might imagine, it isn't really a trick at all. It's a foundational element of all the best stories, the stories we relate to. It's a way to understand your story as perceived by your audience, not through the lens of technology or finance, but focused instead on the problems you'll solve and the experiences you'll enable. Humans delight in imitation, and when the imitation we're shown is magical and inspirational, the stories created will be too. And by employing the trick, you'll be able to craft a uniquely powerful appeal to pathos that extends your story beyond the here and now to a point in the future, with your audience at the center of a world you've created, unencumbered by any practical limitations. Instead, they'll be able to see themselves as Joseph Campbell said, as the hero of their own story. And that's a journey they're far more likely to follow you on. Tips for the Magician The preceding 548 words are, with apologies to a Grecian urn, all ye know on earth, and all ye need know. And apologies to ye, too, I guess. But as I've shared this technique with colleagues and clients, I've seen some of them get stuck or frustrated. So I've come up with two supplemental exercises to help jumpstart the process and to get you to a place where you're able to start thinking about your product or project from a customer experience perspective, which will then, hopefully, get you in the mindset to close those damn eyes. Thing number one. Imagine describing your company or product or service by offering someone a list of 10 songs or 10 movies or 10 works of art or 10 kinds of food or 10 locations or you get the idea. In other words, see if you can find a way to abstract in the truest artistic sense of the word, the core or essence or raison d'etre of your offering and then translate it into another medium unburdened by the limitations of actual real world deliverables. I once worked with a women's healthcare startup founder, and every time she met with her board, they tried to compress her broad vision and perspective down to something narrow and limited, lacking any of the pathos critical to telling a compelling story, especially in a field as personal as women's health. When I suggested this exercise, I thought she might create a music playlist. But what she came up with instead was a list of 10 architectural examples that, for her, spoke to the idea of breaking through old paradigms and reimagining how something new and different could fit harmoniously within the existing world. Thing 2. This is similar to Thing 1, but takes a slightly different approach. Describe your company or product or service without discussing your technology. Period. I once worked with a pair of brilliant startup founders whose tiny team had developed the most surprising technology. 
but each time they made a pitch, they drove straight down into the depths of their code base. I kept saying, don't think of your product as the solution. Rather, think of it as the key to helping someone else solve their problem. We went round and round until finally I said, okay, then simply describe what the company does without talking about the technology. And they couldn't. They couldn't separate the product from the technology. So I said, I was down in Los Angeles this past weekend and I spent some time with my 93-year-old uncle, a retired rabbi. And when he asked me what I was working on, I told him all about your company, but I never mentioned the technology. I only said that your efforts would enable new ways of doing things that would have been previously either unthinkable or too expensive, and that it would allow others to bring new products to market that he would benefit from. And he completely understood the value proposition without knowing anything about the technology other than it was a kind of magic. But he understood that having access to that magic would make his life better, and he was all in. A non-magical approach. Before concluding this section and moving on to putting everything we've discussed into practice, I want to stop and acknowledge that many others have had similar insights and have said much the same thing using fewer words and without the need to besmirch the reputation of magicians, both living and dead. One of the best examples can be seen in the 1997 Apple Worldwide Developers Conference keynote speech, where an audience member asked Steve Jobs about his approach to developing life-changing products. He says, One of the things I've always found is that you've got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. You can't start with the technology and try to figure out where you're going to sell it. I've made this mistake probably more than anyone else in this room, and I've got the scar tissue to prove it. And I know that it's the case. And as we've tried to come up with a strategy and vision for Apple, it started with, what incredible benefits can we give to the customer? Where can we take the customer? Not starting with, let's sit down with the engineers and figure out what awesome technology we have and then how we're going to market it. And I think that's the right path to take. And I think that if he had worn a top hat and maybe taken it off and pulled out a rabbit when he finished speaking, the room would have erupted and they'd still be applauding today. But his insight came from real life and his point remains as important as ever. Can you create an experience that causes your audience to say, I didn't know I needed this, but now I can't live without it? If so, then you've captured your audience's imagination and set the foundation for telling a truly impactful story. Thanks for listening to part one of the Billionaire's Guide to Effective Storytelling and Other Good Advice, a brief primer, presented by the Big Idea Podcast. In part two, we'll take everything we've just learned and assemble it into a complete story. The entire guide is available as a PDF, ebook, and audiobook at linktree slash tbg2est, that's l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash tbg2est, and you can reach me directly on LinkedIn, Robin Diane Goldstein, or by email, robingoldstein at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. This is the Schnauzer Logic Radio Company.